Good morning, you're listening to Conversations with Lulu. I'm Lulu Khazan, an entrepreneur living in Dubai, an investor, a mother, and your host. Today's episode is supported by Primal Alignment. So Primal Alignment is a platform dedicated to people who want to get fit and stay fit. So my friend, Coach Frankie, who's a former Green Beret and a former instructor of the British Commandos training wing, is going to change your life. All you need to do is to register uh, to the online program by visiting primalalignment.net. It's not a personal training session. It's more of a motivation session. So, so check it out. I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to love it. My guest today is the super genuine, absolutely lovely uh, Sonia Weymuller. Uh, she's the co-founder of VentureSook, which is a Dubai-based investment platform that invests in global tech startups. She's previously had a career in media and technology, having worked with Microsoft and Viacom. Sonia sits on several boards. She's a real badass. You can read her extensive bio in the show notes. Sonia, it's so good to have you here with me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm, I'm <laughs> really looking forward to this uh, conversation. You're really you. honest. I, I like that. It's very, it's very refreshing. Thank you. I need more honesty in life. <laughs> uh, we do. And I, and I really love what you guys do at uh, Adventure Souk. I, I mean, I, I've been hearing about Adventure Souk for a while. I recently met one of your partners and he told me all about it. I mean, you essentially give an opportunity for people with some extra cash, let's say, to invest in tech startups. And usually this opportunity is only available to people that are very well connected in the space or super rich people, right? That have, you know, money to put in funds. So how, why, why was this like, uh, how was this born? And how, how is it also now, like now that uh, with COVID, are you still investing actively? Yeah, I mean, uh, we started seven years ago now, right? So the, the venture capital landscape in this region was in incredibly different. It's grown so much over the last years. And so when we started, it was four of us friends. Um, we just started as an informal kind of investor club, you know, side hustle from our day jobs. We started angel investing together. And, um, and what we found was, was that there were actually a lot of people like us in their late 20s and their 30s who wanted to invest in early stage technology businesses, but didn't feel either didn't feel like they had the platform to do so or didn't feel comfortable doing so because it felt like they couldn't make an informed decision. And so we started hosting pitch nights. We invite three entrepreneurs we found interesting. And then it just grew organically. Our friends started inviting their friends. And then fast forward seven years, and we've probably grown into the largest syndicate now in the Gulf. So we have over a thousand angel investors in our network. That's amazing. And are they like, what's the typical profile of an investor? Do you have men and women? Uh... Yeah. So we have about 25% women, actually. Okay. And um, our minimum check size is $10,000. The whole ethos behind VentureSoup when we started is that we wanted to democratize access to good deal flow, exactly what you said. And so, um, so that's why we made our, our minimum somewhat accessible. So the target demo is basically people like us, right? Like young professionals um, don't have half a million to put in a company, but maybe have 15,000, 20,000. And they, each of them can add value in more ways than just a financial check. They can add strategic value based on each person's own professional trajectory. And can anyone join the network? I mean, provided yeah. you can spend ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year on on investing, is there is there any other criteria? No, I mean, um, uh, there's no membership fee. You literally just send any of us an email if you meet us, and we add you to the distribution list. I think what we're becoming better at is understanding what each investor wants. So typically, I'll know that Lulu, for example, is interested specifically in regional deals and maybe specifically in. Uh, the e-commerce space. Let's just say it's that, right? So we don't blast emails out to people with all the opportunities, right? I will only send send Lulu the deals that actually fit her mandate. Um, so, so yeah. So there's no membership fee. Um, ahlan wa sahlan. Everyone can join, and it is meant to be a community. It's a community of investors and of like-minded folks, essentially. And how's it been now with uh, with COVID? Are you are you still actively investing? Yeah, still actively investing. 
Um, listen, I think COVID is difficult for, for a lot of entrepreneurs. I think it is going to be survival of the fittest. I think what's interesting about this period is that most VCs tend to focus on scalability, right? So scalability tends to be the buzzword. How scalable is this business? Is the question that most entrepreneurs get from VCs. And for us now, it's not been a bit scaling up. It's like, how, how good is this company at scaling down, right? And so what how agile is it? So how agile is it to actually cut costs? because it's going to be a difficult fundraising, fundraising environment for many. And so, you know, those companies that have just fundraised are probably in a good spot because they have enough runway for the next at least 12 months, hopefully, if not 24. The ones who haven't fundraised recently are the ones that have to tighten their belt right now. So whether it be laying people off, whether it be cutting costs, salary cuts, uh, marketing, obviously, reductions, etc. There's all these different ways. But I mean, it's kind of the name of the game now, unfortunately. Have people, uh, are people more reluctant now to invest, investors in general? Uh, or have you, like, or are they maybe looking at, are they becoming more picky about certain sectors, for instance? I mean, we, we, had, a, we had an investment that we looked at recently with, with my small network, uh, Kickstart Ventures, and we had, um, we had something which we felt it's, it wasn't an industry that's not going to do well, uh, obviously. And we're starting to yeah. look at um, different types of industries and trying to figure out, okay, what, what are the industries that are going to thrive, basically? Yeah, I mean, you definitely have, I mean, the ones that are going to thrive right now are obviously like last mile delivery services and ed tech and health tech. Um, and so have we seen, uh, we've seen a shift, I would say, especially at the beginning, like in March, April, I think that was also the time of uncertainty where people were like, what is happening? stock market, you know, oil prices, like the whole shebang. It was kind of like, it was a triple black swan essentially, right? So, um, so there was, I think, a pause from some people who were like, you know what, let me just ride this out for a bit and see if, if you know, where, where I stand, you know, in the next two months. Now we're starting to see people um, kind of coming back. I think people have more clarity. They understand that this is the new reality and, you know, you just need to live with it now. Um, and then, you know, we launched, you know this, but we launched also our Conscious Collective at the same time. So Conscious Collective is a platform that I personally been wanting to do for a long time, but uh, we launched it not because of COVID, but just, you know, synchronicity it just happened that it was around the same time. And it's a platform that is, that, that, that is a community of like-minded and mission-driven investors from the region, both individual investors and family offices who want to give their money more purpose and more impact. So. We're, gonna, we're investing right now in, in companies that are, and entrepreneurs that are harnessing the power of technology to actually optimize societal good, financial inclusion, environmental good, etc. And the purpose of that is to show that you can invest in companies that are scalable and tech enabled, and you can get a financial return, but the legacy that these companies have is a long-term one. And so this is something, again, that we just launched and we just made our first investment last month. That's amazing. And I was going to say, I mean, do you find do you find pipeline of, uh, of such companies and where, yeah. where do you draw the line also in between between like a traditional tech business, which could also claim that they are, you know, tackling a societal issue. Right. Uh, I mean, any ed tech can, can say, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to change the world. So where, where do you draw that line? I think it depends on like what the target demographic is for the company. Right. If it's an ed tech company that's targeting like a bunch of affluent kids, that's probably not something that we would look at, right? They really need to fill a gap, of, especially for the underserved, right? If you're an ed tech platform and you're looking to actually democratize learning, that's something that resonates with me a lot more than I've come up with another ed tech platform to make it easier for affluent 10 year olds to, you know, learn online. Um, this is because I come from a, a consulting background, like a strategy background, I like to have like check boxes. And my biggest struggle when I was thinking about building Conscious Collective last year under the Venture Souk umbrella was all right, I know that I want the founders to demonstrate integrity and kind of a strong moral compass and values. What does that mean, right? Because that's somewhat subjective when you think about it, right? And so I spent like a couple of months like being like, what does this mean? Like, how can I translate that into like a checkbox or a rating system, etc.? And I actually met with Mudasser and like a bunch of other ex McKinsey people. So and Mudassar I was like, help the, me. As the, the CEO founder of Kareem. Of Kareem, just, yeah. 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 And so, and all of that, they were, they were like, Sonia, you're overthinking this. And I think it's basically because of the consulting kind of brainwashing that I had, right? Um, you know, you can't define everything necessarily. And so, um, so anyway, so all the deals that we look at for Conscious Collective, 
go through our, our rating system. So we have a proprietary internal kind of rating system that we have at Venture Soup that every deal that comes across our desk is fed through. Obviously, the Conscious Collective one has added columns and added ratings to it because of the impact measurement angle. Um, and then the ones that meet the threshold, um, we get deep, do a deeper dive from a diligence standpoint. And then, again, the top like two or three will end up at the IC. But from a pipeline standpoint, back to your question, no, we have a pipeline of 60 companies that we've built over the last three Locally, months. Locally, regionally, or internationally? We, they're, they're, I mean, our remit is basically pre-Series A, Series A, global. Um, but quite a few companies from this So region, can you actually. clarify what that means, just just to be clear so basically, to everybody yeah, we listening? So what's a, what's a pre-Series A and Series A? So we wouldn't invest, so in, for our purposes, we wouldn't invest in a company that has an like a minimum viable product, like an MVP, and doesn't have any traction, and they're still testing stuff out, etc. That's just too early. For and by traction, collection. you mean revenue, or what do you mean exactly? Yeah, there, there has to be some proof of concept, right? That this is demonstrating a, a need, and that there's demand for this product specifically. So, um, so yeah, so there has to be some level of traction. The other things that we look at, obviously, aside from the traction, is who are the other investors, right? Because we wouldn't lead any of the rounds because our check sizes are pretty small. Um, but if there's a, a well-known investor who has experience in the specific sector, if it's environmental technology, for example, that would be taken into account as well. Um, and in fact, we would probably speak with that investor as well about the investment. Um, so yeah, I mean, like any VC, you look at team, you look at product, um, and then you look at obviously what the competitive landscape is like. But the team obviously at this stage is what's the most important, right? Because you can have you can have the greatest idea in a mediocre team and the idea is not going to go anywhere, right? You've heard this before, right? But you can have a, okay, interesting idea, but an amazing team. And then that'll skyrocket most likely. I think an amazing team can, uh, you know, can maybe even trump the idea. We, we invested in a, in a company recently that's in the, in the B2B travel space. And obviously, <laughs> B2B travel is now, you know, non-existent. So, and they're, they're actually pivoting, you know, they're, they're working on new ideas. Uh, and, and that's what strong founders do. So I, I think the team, you know, the team is super important. I love your point about um, uh, like a checklist, a founder checklist. I, I, you know, I would be interested to know what, what you come up with uh, yeah. eventually. I mean, I think, yeah. Because I'll well, tell I mean, you why. No, I think- yeah, I tell you why we, you know, I think we we are all we all have our biases, right? So so sometimes and and unconscious biases. So sometimes maybe you you might have certain criteria in mind, but you meet someone and you like them, for example, and you you waver on on several of these criteria, but you might have been reading like the wrong signals. Uh, and and you know, I I attended a course. Um, a while back about uh, about entrepreneurship and and one of the things that he talked about is when you're hiring people to join your startup it's very important to actually write down the criteria for for the people uh, from a characteristics and a, and a skills standpoint and then rank them and then try as much as you can to kind of tick them on you know tick the people on this uh, uh, rating mechanism so that you are not uh, taken over by your biases but I think it goes a deeper, a deeper level than that even, right? Because typically the first thing we look at, right, as investors is like, okay, like what experience does the founder have? Do they have relevant experience? Where did they go to school? Did they start a business before? Did it fail? Did it succeed, et cetera? But I actually think like with Conscious Collective, we like to go kind of one further step, which is actually get to know the founder as a human being, right? Like I think when I look even for us as Venture Soup, I'm sure it's the same with you. It's like you have kind of these initial conversations with founders that get get a feel for them and, and you know, whether you get along and because this is a marriage ultimately, right, if you're investing in a company. But I think um, my learning, at least for Conscious Collective, is actually getting to know the founder at a deeper level and understanding where this company fits in their own journey. Because when I look back at some of the companies even that we've invested to as Venture Souk, um, the ones, some of that, some of the ones that have struggled are ones that were led by founders that were still trying to find themselves, you know. And sometimes the, the idea might be great, and the founder has a great ba- background, but maybe the timing is not right, you know. Maybe the timing is not right for that founder to start this business, for whatever reason, right? So, and do so you these say are the that things to, to potential sorry? founders. Do you do you say that to potential founders? I've said that to this one that I have that I'm talking about in the, in, in my mind right now. Yeah, I've, I've had that conversation with him. Okay. Um, and he ended up leaving the business actually to go find himself. You know, and, and then he passed on the torch to another uh, to, to his co-founder, essentially. And, and that's important because it, it's 
it's, it's, it's normal, right? Forget our ecosystem. I think we're all kind of on this journey of, of self-awareness and trying to kind of better understand ourselves, right? Um, and, you know, they say that for relationships even, right? Even like, you know, you should know yourself before you get into a relationship or marry someone else, right? It's important that you know what you want before you get into a relationship with someone else. And I think it's the same in this case as well, right? You want to make sure that the founder is, is self-aware enough. And that takes work. Self-awareness doesn't just happen like this. I mean, both you and I know that. Like, we're still takes discovering time. things about it takes time. Yeah, it does take time. And you're going to evolve as a human being as well, right? So it's just making sure that, like, all the ingredients are there at the right time, essentially. That's, by the way, one of my things when, uh, when you have all of these programs that try to encourage university students to become entrepreneurs. And like to me, I'm thinking, OK, I, I started Nambish when I was 30. Uh, and still, I feel like I was relatively young, you know, to have that responsibility. Uh, yeah. And now I'm, I'm 39 and like I'm a, dif- I'm a different person almost. Yeah. So try to think like you're 24 years old, 23 years old. I mean, what do you think? Would you would you? Do you think it's a good idea to encourage people out of uni- straight out of university to become entrepreneurs? No, but like even the even the high I mentor quite a few high school kids even who are applying to college, and I've told them the same thing. Just like I tell to actually that my mentees who are in university, like my NYU Abu Dhabi, for example, for example, interns. I always say like to the high school students, I say go with an open mind. When I went for my undergrad to the U.S., I thought I was going to major in econ because I did my French baccalaureate in econ in Paris, right? So I was like, oh well, this makes sense, right? Got there, but then I took all these amazing. Different. That's the beauty of the liberal arts education in the U.S., I have to say. It's like you take all these amazing classes and you only have to decide what you're going to focus on by the end of your second year of university. And I ended up, you know, thinking I was going to major in art history, thinking I was going to major in sociology, and then I ended up majoring in politics, right? And so what I say is that, and that's why I don't believe in five-year plans. I think five-year plans are maybe somewhat useful kind of to have kind of goals maybe kind of directionally. Yeah, directionally, right? But I definitely have never been the type of chick who's like, okay, like, Five years from now, I want to be, you know, partner at a, at a venture capital firm or I want to be, you know, VP at McKinsey or whatever. Right. Like I've never I think it's important to have an idea maybe of where you want to head, but you also need to be open. Right. Like life throws you all kinds of different things. And if you're not open to accepting that, you're going to miss out on a lot. And that's what I tell these 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 little ducklings of mine is keep an open mind, even the ones that are in university, like, you know, yes, you think you want to go into consulting because that's what everyone around you is doing, right? Because yeah, it makes but money. Maybe, yeah, but, you know, op- open up, right? So that's why we have some NYU interns who definitely didn't fit the bill of, you know, econ majors or whatever. Um, but, you know, they're interested in the space. They're learning a lot. They're actually adding a lot of value to us as well, right? Because they come from a different background and different perspective. Yeah, well... That's 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 pretty cool, and uh, and I'm I'm glad you agree. I was gonna say, um, I think maybe instead of having a five year five year plan, what would be really good is to have a set of values, maybe that that kind of drive you, you know. So maybe maybe you would say, okay, I'm a, I'm gonna be open and honest uh, in all my interaction, or or I'm going to be uh, helpful, or or a certain set of values, maybe that kind of be your guiding principles versus saying like, in five years, I want to be this. Would you Would you agree? No, I agree. And I also think that, I, I think the educational system needs to shift as well, which is why it's going to be interesting to see what happens now, right? That we're seeing a bit of a shift happening to online. Because I think when you're in, at least when I think when I was in university, for example, you know, we had everyone from like the CIA to McKinsey to Goldman Sachs, all recruiting on our campus, right? So that's what you're surrounded by. You don't see the Lulus and the Sonias on campus recruiting for jobs, right? You kind of see these these mainstream players, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And I think in retrospect, I wish I had had a Lulu, for example, come to my school and have this honest discussion about, about, I think maybe it's happening now, to be fair, like I'm not that young. So, I mean, I did graduate 15 years ago. (laughs) So things may obviously have evolved since then. but not yeah, much. I mean, there are things. Not much. I, I'm, I'm mentoring university students uh, even today, and, and I still yeah. see this. You know, you have uh, Emirati uh, uh, students that want to join the government because, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a lot of hours and they get paid really well and stuff like that. So it's very difficult to, I, and I'm sure, you know, everybody uh, else would probably want to work for those big companies versus uh, working for like a smaller company and stuff. So it's, it's yeah. still there. And there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. And maybe maybe what we need to do when we mentor uh, uh, high school students and university students is maybe talk to them about the entrepreneurial mindset and maybe yeah. not necessarily them going out and launching startups, but but how to think maybe like entrepreneurs. Yeah. yeah. And also just not to overthink, I think. <laughs> 
because I think there's a lot of pressure when you're in school. You're getting pressure from the school and you're getting pressure from your families, especially there's a cultural angle to this as well, right? When you come from the East, whether it be from the Middle East or whether it be from, you know, uh, South Asia, it's the same thing, right? It's like, oh, you should be a doctor, you should be an engineer, you should be at this, you should be at that, right? But then that's why you kind of have to also open up your networks and meet different kinds of people from different walks of life so that you also kind of get to know what resonates with you specifically. So you're, 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 you call yourself a Frindian. I am. I am definitely a Frindian. And uh, it's my nickname. I'm called Frindy. <laughs> my Instagram, it's uh, Frindiana so what, what's Jones. A, what's a Frindian? A Frindian is, is basically because I'm half French, half Indian. So, um, so that's why. I was, I was speaking to uh, a friend yesterday who's uh, Scottish Emirati. And I was like, what are you? <laughs> and he, I'm like, a Scottarati. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bicultural, uh, and I'm also a third culture kid. So really, how, how did that work? A, fr a French, like the French are, are like reserved, quiet, right? Kind of. I don't know about that. No? I mean, okay. we're not scared. But like Indians yeah. are, you know, they're, 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 they're lively, they're bubbly. So how, how did this match work? It worked. I mean, listen, until my dad passed away, like my parents were like, super lovey-dovey like holding hands and like you know embarrassingly for me and <laughs> you know um no I think you know it doesn't work all the time for sure I think but I think you know it's 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 like almost like a team even you know in a startup team it's like complementary skill sets and complementary personalities almost right so you you want to make sure with anyone in your life again whether it be a partner or a colleague that you're bringing out the best in the other person right and I think they brought the best out of each other like my dad was from a conservative French family and my mom kind of brought up this fun side to him and then my mom is kind of like you know a 65 year old version of me and so you know he reined her in maybe a little bit and then together it kind of worked they met midway very very nice and they and they also uh you you mentioned you had mentioned that they also come from different religions right so they're not it's yeah not only so my mom was raised yeah it was, not, yeah it was, it was religious as well so my mom comes from a Muslim Indian family my dad very French uh Catholic Um, so actually, I was raised Catholic and my sister was raised Muslim. So I'm, I'm baptized, confirmed in the whole shebang. Um, and I, I, I'm now agnostic and spiritual, by the way. But uh, I went to a Jesuit high school. Like I did the whole, you know, so royal how, religious path. How, how, how does that work? Like, so you celebrated basically all the... Everything. Like, you said, okay, yeah, and my mom, came, cool. my mom came to church with me and, um, you know, and then... Obviously, like I would be also exposed to, to, to Islamic prayers, etc. I didn't pray five times a day necessarily, but um, and I think it's beautiful. We need more of this. But why? This why was today. someone raised Christian or Muslim? Are you like half sisters or? Yes, my, okay. my mom. So yeah, my as much as my mom's first marriage, basically when she was uh, okay. 18, the young arranged marriage. Um, okay. But I consider her my, my 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 full sister. We're very very different. We look very different, and we have completely opposite personalities. My sister's a poet, so. She's wow. the intellectual one, actually. Yeah, she's the intellectual one. Well, and and what about you? I'm just the street smart one. <laughs> You're the street smart one. Okay. Well, that's that's a good. Uh, that works as well. Yeah, complimentary. Uh, that works pretty well. So, uh, where your uh, both your parents were working? My were working when? I when mean, they met? Uh, yeah, were they? No, were so they... My, my parents actually met in Pakistan in the 70s, and Pakistan in the 70s was. A very different place to the Pakistan. Like it was actually a lot of Europeans were hanging out in Pakistan in the 70s, very open, uh, a lot happening, etc. And my dad was working at the French consulate, and uh, and my mom had just gotten divorced in India and went to Pakistan, where my grandparents were, were then living, and uh, with my with my sister. And um, yeah, and they met through mutual friends. And uh, my dad was younger than her actually, and um, wow. and then they hit it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then they hit it off. Wow. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, and then fast forward, uh, you know, whatever, 10 years later, they got married and stuff, and then, you know, I appeared. <laughs> and you appeared. And, and why, what did they, I mean, what was important to them that they kind of, like, passed on to you? Both families, I think, but especially, I think, maybe more, like, my mom's family, maybe especially, but, like, definitely the idea that, that if, that, like, you know, that if, if you can be helpful be helpful to people, you know? And I think that that's something that I've held close to my heart since I was a kid, essentially. And I think that's probably actually one of the first things that people would say if you were to ask them to describe me is like, well, Sonia's super helpful or she's a connector or some people have called me a human router because I'll just automatically connect people. No expectations, but just like if I'm having a conversation with you and I'm like, oh, Lulu mentioned this, I should introduce her to so-and-so. 
and then I just make the connections. Um, that's my way, I guess, of, of, of contributing to someone's journey is, is just kind of making sure that people who I feel should maybe cross paths can cross paths. And sometimes people don't have the access, right? It's an accessibility issue necessarily. And I'm fortunate, I think, that I have access to quite a, a lot of different people from different backgrounds. Like I don't only hang out in my ecosystem kind of echo chamber, you know? So I know, I know people from all kinds of different industries and different verticals and different trajectories, et cetera, where I feel like I'm good at matching and hopefully something productive and positive comes out of, of that encounter. That's a, that's a huge um, uh, skill to have, right? Also, I mean, well, it's not, and it's not, you know, what I've noticed, it's not something that people do. I don't know why. I feel like, yes, I think yeah. a lot of people are very territorial about their relationships, you know? And I find that's a pity because Actually, if you all people, kind of, some people benefit uh, financially from their relationship. And yeah, and then some people obviously attach yeah, a commission or whatever, which yeah. I, I would not do. But um but yeah, which is unfortunate because like if you feel strongly that two people should meet, you should just facilitate that and let them and something beautiful might come out of that meeting, you know, and you've been part of that journey, like, have, you know. Have you been helpful at all and then you regretted it or you felt that maybe the, the people weren't worthy of your help or something? Has it, has it ever backfired? Not that I know of, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't, right? It's just that it hasn't come back to me that it backfired maybe. I mean, obviously there are conversations that I was like, oh, like, thanks for introducing me. You know, I had a good conversation. It doesn't go anywhere, right? But whatever, you never know. Again, I believe in synchronicity in life, and it might not be useful for you to have to, to kind of engage with this person right now. But maybe two years from now, you're on a different path, and you're like, oh wow, I should reconnect with Lulu. You know, I agree um, with you fully. Yeah, never, yeah. never burn a bridge. Actually, I think that's very, that's very important, and always be helpful if you can. And that's why I think it's important to always have conversations, and even with entrepreneurs. And this is an advice to the entrepreneurs who are actually watching this. Um, if someone like if, if you ever encounter me and I say, oh, you should meet so and so just send me a thank you at least, you know, because that actually that's happened a lot where you where you send a lot of intros and people are not appreciative or don't recognize it. And I actually find that's very um, bad behavior. <laughs> uh, I'm not expecting anything in return, but a simple thank you is, is I think, nice. Don't don't just expect that your investors or your people who are looking at your business will just automatically open up their doors. Not everyone does. So if they do. Be grateful for that, you know, and just say thank you. Like you didn't need to go out of your way. I appreciate it, you know. That's very true. You're 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 very helpful also on a on a personal level. I know last time you and I spoke, you told me about uh, about Sisu. Yes. <laughs> Where is Sisu? Me. She's behind you. So I so you can see her. Oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Sisu is Sisu is a rescued disabled cat. Yes, I found her uh, on the road here in Dubai. Uh, she was crawl at night, so she was crawling with the strength of her two front legs, dragging her back. Like she'd been hit by a car, I think. Um, and and then I drove by, and because it was dark, so I was like, okay, weird. So I just you know, I let her pass without knowing what was happening. And then I thought about it. I was like, something's off. So I drove back, parked the car, and then realized that she actually couldn't move her back legs. And so then I didn't know what to do. I was in shock. So I just sat next to her on the road and I started singing Bob Marley to her to calm myself down, but also to calm, you know, everything's going to be all right. Yeah, right. And, uh, and then that's when I saw the beauty of, of Dubai's like, you know, kind of grassroots community when it comes to animal rescue. I'm part of this Facebook group. I posted, I was like, help, I'm here. I don't know what to do. And then within half an hour, someone showed up with a cat carrier. I was like, Sonia, take her to this vet that's open at 9 p.m. Um, etc. And then, yeah, and then the vet said, like, she's not going to walk again. She's final injury, put her down. And I was like, I don't, I don't feel like I want to do that. And so she's not in pain. Uh, she zooms around. And I think she's healing me as much as, much as I'm healing her, actually, to be perfectly, to be perfect. Little wow. cat of determination. <laughs> I, wow, that's, that's oh. such a, such a sweet story. And, and what, what does Sisu, what does Sisu mean? So, see, so when you get to the vet here, they ask you for the patient's name, right? And I was like, patient's names. And I was thinking like Greek goddess names, like strong names. I wanted a strong name, right? Then I came across this word called Sisu in Finnish, it's a Finnish word. And it basically means um, extreme courage in the face of extraordinary adversity. And what I found out, interestingly, because two weeks later, my tenant who ended up taking my flat was actually Finnish. Um, he said that this is actually a way of being in Finland. Like if you Google Sisu, there's books written on becoming or finding your Sisu and all this stuff. And it's actually like, it's, 
it's 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 a philosophy of life in Finland, which I found fascinating. People name their boat Sisu. My friend actually uses the word Sisu, American friend, by the way, to um, to define kind of what entrepreneurs need to succeed. Wow! Because it's resilience and it's grit, you know. Um, yeah, so it's it's and it's a short, cute name as well, but it's also just a meaningful name. So well, she, she's she's lucky to have found you. That's for sure. Yes, you well, are, they say uh, cats find you, so <laughs> she they, definitely found they do the right them. human. <laughs> They do, they do. You are, you are a softy after all. I mean, that's that's. I that's do such have a, a soft heart amidst that, the, you know, the strong appearance sometimes. Yeah, people think you're strong. I think a lot of us people have this image of uh, of, of strength, right? Like if you look at a lot of the female founders in our ecosystem, Sarah Appleton, Amreen Musa, you, me, like I think everyone thinks that everyone probably thinks we have it all figured out, right? And we don't. Like, I mean, I don't think any of us have it. I mean, I can't speak for Sarah and, and, and Breen, but I mean, or you even, but like, I, you know, I haven't figured it out. I'm just kind of on my journey and just kind of appreciating the journey that I'm on while keeping an open mind and being receptive to, to other things that come into my life. So um, I think it's difficult for, for women because on the one hand, they feel like they need to portray a certain, especially in this region where it's very image centric and, you know, you feel like you need to portray a certain a certain image on stage, for example, when you're speaking, when really I think what resonates the most with people who listen or watch you on stage is, is your authenticity, right? Like sharing kind of the, the hard milestones that you've had in your life, not just the good ones, because it's more likely than, than not that most people are going to go through those hard times. So it's a lot more kind of helpful if you actually talk about those hard times than rather than you just talk about the good times and how you made it, how your success and like, etc. It's like, no, like, you know, how did you address some of the tough times that you actually encountered in your life? No, but nobody asks you these questions, though. Like if you, you know, every yeah. every press article that you read out there, it's always about so and so has raised so much money or so and so has sold their company or, or, or it's always, uh, you know, and that puts a lot of pressure success, on success, quote unquote. Yeah, it puts a lot of pressure on entrepreneurs. And I really feel for the entrepreneurs today, the ones that are struggling because of COVID, because you have this huge amount of pressure. You see all these articles left, right and center on all these raises and all these like successful founders, like on the front, front page of all these magazines and stuff. And then you just, you know, what, what, how does that make you feel about yourself? You know, and I do think that mental health is something that's not being addressed here, especially within the entrepreneurial community. We have quite a few vocal people who talk about it on their social media, but I don't think there's like, I think we need to be more organized in how we how we deal with mental health issues amongst the entrepreneurs specifically. And I don't think there are enough tools and resources out there. Um, and I think, I hope that that's something that may come out of, of this period even. Well, maybe, maybe with something we should have as a group for entrepreneurs in this region that are having problems that want to like just vent and, and, and talk about them. But it's tough like, because you know, entrepreneurs sometimes don't feel comfortable doing that because no. they don't want to be seen as weak, you know? Yeah, but maybe like what I should. did a session. Tell I did a session a, a month ago with uh, an entrepreneur in Bahrain, and it was the most beautiful session. He opened up about so many different topics, from spirituality to this culture of shame. You know, he left his cushy job to do this 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 startup, and uh, and it was surreal for me because I was like, you know what? In the normal circumstances, I would have never had this conversation with this entrepreneur, right? But he was all he needed was a listener, you know, an active listener, and. And for us to be able to have this conversation, I mean, like a Bahraini male entrepreneur opening up to a female expat investor, you know, um, I think he just needed to be heard and heard by someone who kind of understands, you know, his world. So not a friend or a spouse or, you know, or someone who can't relate to what they're going to, through. And so this is a conversation I've had with quite a few people around me. I was talking about this yesterday with a friend as well, where it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be. I'm not a trained psychiatrist, by the way, but. I empathize because I understand what some of these entrepreneurs are going through. And sometimes if I can help just with a, a few words or just even listen, I think that's what they need. They just need to get it off their chest. It's like a form of release almost, you know? I think we need to, we need to ask, like, somebody needs to ask the questions as well. And maybe also not label, like, you, it's not like you're a successful entrepreneur or you're a failure, right? So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot that kind of goes on in the middle and maybe if we don't put labels and we start asking more exciting questions, you know, the people that are in the media space instead of like, OK, how much did you raise and what's your expansion plan? But maybe, you know, they have other challenges. Well, I challenge you to then have a panel of three entrepreneurs who will be willing to be open with you and share some of the challenges that they faced. And then you ask the right questions, exactly what you just said. 
challenge expected. I hope, I'm, I'm also happy, I think, to share my experience as well. Because also, you know, sometimes you hear about these raises, but it doesn't mean that the terms were good to the yeah. entrepreneur. So maybe they did raise this $5 million or $10 million, but maybe the terms were very punitive, right? So no one knows the details. Uh, and no one shares. That's the thing. I'm sure you, you discussed this with, with, with Philip as well at Magnet, right? Is that no yeah. one's really opening their kimonos. I'm the first one to say that we don't open our kimono either, right? When it comes to our proprietary kind of data on, on startups and raises, etc. right? That's why, you know, research outlets do struggle with this region because people just don't feel comfortable being transparent necessarily. Or it'll come out, it'll come out like a few years later, maybe. Um, maybe for entrepreneurs also, you have, you have, uh, you, you, you have, a challenge on on several ends, right? On the one end, you are um, compared head to head, let's say, with your corporate friends that have great jobs and you know getting their promotions and their bonuses and so on. And there you are, you know, trying to 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 launch this business and become successful. And then you're gonna hit some challenges. And then on the other hand, you have these entrepreneurs raising the funds and you know doing really well. And like you're you're screwed, <laughs> like you're in the middle and you're like, damn. Uh, and and I'm sure it happens 90% of the time, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if you do decide to take kind of the entrepreneurial plunge and you can speak about this as well, right? Like, it's not a decision where that you just make in a day, right? Like, I remember even when I jumped ship on my end from corporate to venture souk, um, I, I soundboarded with my mentors. And I guess in my case, I was at a point in my career where I felt like the learning curve was stagnant. And so I felt like this was the right time to do it because I was in my late twenties, didn't have any responsibilities, still don't have any responsibilities other than my cat. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, but um, but you know, it was it was kind of the, the right time, right place, right time type of scenario. Um, but that said, it's still a major decision to take because you're you know, you're leaving the the comfort of a cushy monthly paycheck towards kind of the unknown, essentially. So right? why why did you do it? Like I mean, you could have taken another job in a different industry. I could have very easily done that. Yeah. So, um, so I had job why you start a business? Job. I think so. My dad passed away 10 years ago, pretty suddenly, like as in like died in front of me pretty much um, at a young age and he was healthy enough. And so I can say this in retrospect because I don't think I process, processed it in this way when I was 25 when it happened. But um, in retrospect, I don't think I would have had the, the courage to actually jump ship had it not been for his passing, because I think unless you've been through something like that, where either you lose a parent or you lose a close friend, et cetera, you don't really think about your mortality. I mean, you kind of think about it, but like, you know, it's not like front of mind necessarily. And so, so when he passed away, I kind of had to take kind of step up in the family and essentially act as like almost like the older son in a family, you know, and kind of take over kind of the, the admin stuff and, and the finances and, and all that stuff. And obviously be there for my mom, my sister. And, um, and so I feel like I matured a lot, like it accelerated my, my, my entry into adulthood almost um, between the ages of, of 25 onwards, essentially. Um, and so I think it made me a lot more reflective, not at that specific time, but maybe in the years after that, in terms of how I'm, I'm spending my time and what I want to do. And I think that's why I ended up feeling motivated because I was like, you know what? Life is short. Like if I don't do this now, who knows what will happen? And I didn't, if I hadn't had that kind of mindset because of what happened, I probably would have gone for that other job offer that was cushy, you know? Um, so yeah, so I do, I do, I do owe it to my dad, I think, for pushing me in a way. Um, he's probably, and, I, and he's probably laughing from heaven, by the way, because my dad was in finance and his dream was for me to end up in finance like him. And I resisted, resisted, resisted. Um, and then now it's kind of come full circle. I'm actually in finance, financing startups. So, <laughs> so he's probably having a good laugh. I'm sure he's happy and he's proud. You've done, no, you've done, proud. you've I done, you've done really well. He what about your proud. mom? What did she want you to be? Um, my mom usually, really uh, usually Indians have a plan, right? Like a long-term plan for yeah, their kids. But my mom's, but my mom's own trajectory was a bit different herself, right? Like she got married very early and like you know got divorced very early, and then so she's always been very open. In fact, when I applied for college in the states, I went to quite a conservative high school where. In the history of my high school, no one had ever gone to school in the States. Um, you want to go abroad, you go to the UK, you go to Germany, but you don't go to the US. And so, um, so when I was applying for universities, it's actually my mom who was very encouraging um, of, of my applying because, you know, even though it's far from, from Paris and stuff, she was like, you need to find yourself and, and the liberal arts kind of education system is a good one to kind of 
you know, test stuff out. It's not like you have to apply with a specific major like some of the other educational system in other markets. So, so my mom, so my mom also had, had her own challenges. So she got cancer, breast cancer when, uh, about 26 years ago, touch wood, she's fine. She's still alive and kicking it and rocking it. Um, and, um, I was nine at the time and that's what prompted actually the move. We were living in Tokyo at the time to New York for her treatment. And, um, yeah, it was, it was quite shocking. I mean, obviously as, as a nine year old, but I don't think I understood what was happening. Like, I didn't know what cancer was. I didn't know what chemo was. I didn't know what any of these things. I could see that my mom looked a bit different. Um, but that was it. I definitely didn't, you know, I wasn't mature enough to reflect on what was happening. I was, I was more worried about, oh my God, like we just moved from Tokyo. I didn't get to say goodbye to my friends and I have to make new friends in the school in New York now. <laughs> you know, like when you're nine, it's like, you know, I mean, I think nine year olds today are probably very different because they're more precocious. But, you know, back in the age of innocence, when you and I were, were, were like normal kids, <laughs> free social media, uh, we were still pretty innocent, right, at that age. But for you not so, to feel it, like she must have been quite strong, you know, and, uh, and fighting it. And my mom is extremely I mean, some strong. Some people would forth. probably break down when they have uh, such news, right? I'm sure she did break down. I'm sure there were breakdowns kind of in the background. Obviously, she wouldn't show that to her, her daughter necessarily, or her daughters necessarily. But, um, but back to the earlier point of, 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 of helping, even after her treatment, she would still go to the hospital where she was treated and sit in the waiting room and just talk to the other patients there, you know, uh, because she felt that, you know, it, it, she, they could empathize and, you know, she could empathize with their experience and seeing her having gone through it is, is, would, would give them kind of, you know, positive, a positive outlook on their own treatment. It's amazing. So... So yeah, I mean, strong, even, strong women. You know, back again, if you go back, you know, talking also openly about cancer, it wasn't wasn't something that people just did, right? People just didn't really share these things, and uh, and in general, like people who are sick, they're usually uh, uh, it's it's difficult for them to get like the support around them. So it's it's amazing, like what she's done. It's also cultural, I think. Like I think again, back to the East, I think that the U.S. speaks very openly about diseases and illnesses, etc. I think here in the East, whether again, whether it be the Middle East or, or Far East, etc., um, there is it is culturally yeah. taboo. Actually, yeah. even in France, to be honest, like it's culturally taboo. Um, people just don't talk about illnesses because I think maybe because it's perceived as a sign of weakness when it really should be maybe when it should be perceived as a sign of strength, because, you know, yes, you're being vulnerable because of what's happening, but, you know, you're also getting through it, you know, so it should be seen as a and so that's a narrative that needs to change as well. Right. And we're seeing this change now because quite a few women who are well known, who've had all kinds of illnesses, have been very vocal about it through their social media channels. Um, but yeah, but that was a different time. Again, this was pre iPhone, pre social media, pre, you know, it's a different era. almost. Where do you stand? I mean, great point. I was going to mention social media. So where, where do you stand on being like, vocal for the with the purpose of educating uh and creating empathy uh, and helping people understand for example how to deal with uh, such diseases or vocal uh, and just basically airing everything out on social media and you know putting all the details out and yeah i mean i think there's two things in that like one is that i think awareness is very important and i think that's one thing that social media does well um most of the time, maybe not all the time, but at least in terms of when it comes to uh, bringing awareness around specific diseases or illnesses or, or challenges, um, people airing about it. I personally don't have I, I personally don't have an issue with it. Like it's their own journey, and that's the second point, right? It's that people who are going through things like this, health challenges, for example, have their own way of dealing with it. Some people just don't want to talk about it, or they prefer to meditate on it or, you know, it's a personal journey. Others, it's therapeutic to talk about it. It's therapeutic for them to post pictures of themselves going through their treatments on social media or the journeys, etc. And I think ultimately to each their own, like I'm not one to judge, etc. I do think when it comes to, so for example, with cancer specifically, um, I think people, especially people our age, like you always think, oh, like, so-and-so died of cancer, that's never going to happen to me. Or you watch like a movie and like someone has cancer in the movie and it's like, all right, this is sad. Well, this is never going to happen to me, right? So I do feel like sometimes it's kind of that fine balance because certain words are heavily loaded with a certain connotation. And if used, you actually end up alienating people because they won't think about it necessarily. They, they just think that it's, it doesn't concern them when it might very well concern them, you know, especially this day and age where cancer is getting younger and younger now, right? 
So, so what um, do you mean? Do you mean like if you want to talk about cancer, you'd rather not say, for example, cancer and talk about like illness in a, in a, in a broader perspective? Because you feel no, like I'm saying everyone say, should, I think everyone should do whatever they want, right? And I, okay. I think it's, that's what I'm saying, is that fine balance because you do need the awareness. People need to be aware of, of, of breast cancer or testicular cancer or lung cancer or any of these things. Just like people need to be aware of the, the COVID symptoms, right? Like when you're seeing these videos of people in hospital from people our age saying, guys, like this is not an easy ride. Like I've been in the hospital for like a month and a half now and I still can't walk without feeling tired. You need that level of awareness as well, right? Um, so I don't think, again, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's just that, you know, Awareness is important, but I still feel like most people who are healthy don't necessarily, it doesn't resonate with them, is what I'm trying to say, right? It's true. So you think it, it doesn't it wouldn't happen to me. I'm healthy, I'm fit. It's never going to happen to me. Absolutely. Exactly. Until exactly. it does. And what do you do? That's like you, you've had, you've had some, some health challenges on a yeah, personal level. Yeah, I've had serious health. Yeah. yeah. You, yourself. I've, I've, like yeah. Not, not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I had serious health challenges in, in, in 2018, where I also had to undergo treatment for uh, about eight months total. Um, and, um, so how did you like feel? I mean, you, you look like a healthy person, you know, you look like someone who's, uh, spiritual and takes care of her body and mind. So, yeah. so yeah, and I know in my case, I mean, obviously initial shock, like anyone, and then, and then it's just acceptance, pure acceptance. And I can say this now in retrospect, but like, I'm actually grateful that what happened happened because I don't think I would be where I am today had that not happened. I really see that episode in my life as like a kick in the butt. Like, get your act together, Sonia. You've like strayed away from your authentic self almost. And and I had, I think, you know, like I got busy with the speaker circuit and like, you know, you get busy with life and work, etc. And I started, I think I've just forgotten who I actually was, you know. And I think going through something like that kind of beautifully made me realign with who I actually am. It brought me back to my authentic self. It brought me back to the actual Sonia, not the, again, what we were talking about, the projected image of Sonia and the, you know, et cetera. And so it made me, it was eight months where I did a lot of, of introspection. I wrote a lot. I tried to learn Arabic. I painted. Um, I, I spent a lot, a lot of my friends came to visit me during that period. I spent a lot of times rekindling relationships that people I hadn't seen even in years who came to see me. Um, and so it was, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful episode. I definitely think I came out of it stronger and, and, and wiser. Um, and I don't wish this on anyone, but for anyone who is facing health challenges, I think it's important to keep a, a positive mind and a lot of the health challenge that you're going to face and whether or not you get out of it will be based on how you choose to deal with it. And it, the power is in your hands. And I can't stress this enough. I really believe in the power of mind over body. And yes, I did conventional stuff, but I also did alternative stuff. So I did acupuncture. I did a lot of sound healing. And I was so impressed with the effect that sound healing had on my body during my treatment, for example, that the year after my treatment, I actually became a certified sound healer myself. Um, what, because, what, yeah, I mean, what is sound healing? Treatment. So you see these bowls if you go to yoga studios or like meditation centers, etc. But this is like, so I have seven bowls, for example, in my house. And like, if you were to come to my house, you would like, super relaxing, by the way, for the person who's receiving it, you just lie on the floor, you don't have to do anything, you just lie there. And then I basically do kind of these, I, I put these bowls on different parts of your body to release um, certain parts of your body that might be blocked. And, um, and obviously, because like, if you think, if you put water in any of these bowls, and you hit it, you'll see the droplets of water because of the sign sound coming out, right? You think that our bodies are made up of 65 to 70% of water, that's the effect that sound has on our body as well. And since then, I've become super hypersensitive to sound as well. Like, I'm super careful of what I choose to bring into my body as a sound, right? Like, the type of music that I choose to listen to. Like, I'm, I'm very mindful, actually, of, of, of toxic noise, essentially. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, listen, I, I'm I, learning I, so I much not, about you. <laughs> I'm not, by the way, I'm not like some, like, you know, kind of UAG yogi type person. I don't do yoga or anything. But there's certain things, like, sound healing is actually scientifically backed. Like, there's certain things that that I think are not part of our conventional approaches in medicine that should be taken into account, actually, um, including acupuncture. I've done acupuncture on Sisu as well, by the way. And <laughs> poor well, Sisu. I mean, we did, I know, we she did must have sessions. freaked out. 
No, she was so calm. I was so proud of her. Really? Um, yeah, I've done sound healing on her as well, by the way. Um, but um, no, we had to stop. We only did two sessions because then COVID hit. So yeah, but I have pictures of her with little, you can follow her on Instagram. She's on Sisu Says. She has little, her little thing on her spine. And she was calm. Even the vet was like, Sonia, I'm so impressed. Like usually I have to sedate animals when I do this. And she just is there for 20 minutes with needles in her. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, impressive, huh? like mother like daughter <laughs> yeah, good on you good on you i like that so so your first kick in the butt basically was your 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 father's passing and that kind of yeah. shook you and you decided kind of to, to change course and then 2018 with with your health challenge was was the second one so do we do we need a kick in the butt to get moving hopefully you don't like not as drastic as these kicks in the butt i mean i would say this before i answer like i think those when if, if i look at these two kind of uh curveballs essentially um the first one i reacted very differently obviously to the obviously it's question of maturity and age as well but when i was 25 and dealing with this i was in shock i was actually dealt with it via escapism so i asked work to give me more work you know i was going out with friends i was not spending time with myself to actually address what had just happened and instead I was just trying to keep myself busy to not think about it and I actually think that ended up hitting me in the ass and it's probably why I got you know sick again uh well sick that 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 first time in 2018 uh was I think a lot of pent-up emotions as well that weren't addressed the second time that I that the curveball so my health issue this this time I chose to actually address it head-on and and I think I would obviously maturity is one thing but but also I think just realizing that I didn't deal with that first curveball the way I should have, you know? And so and, and what I found myself interestingly in 2018 is I ended up dealing with both curveballs that year. I finally accepted and dealt with my father's death and I accepted and dealt with what I was going through as well. So yeah, so I think in a way, I, blessing in disguise because I think I believe in epigenetics and I believe in emotions linked to your health etc and you know there's a lot of stuff that's just that we don't know about why we get sick right like even, even if you think about something like cancer like you know we all have cancer cells in our body why is it that they're catalyzed in like my mom and not you you know like it, it, it's all these we don't know like do doctors are very good at treating the symptoms they don't know what originates like how it originates so um so yeah so it's, it's been interesting so what what would you say i mean having been through what you've been through uh, what would you say to someone who's feeling overwhelmed, you know, or who is, uh, or who is dealing with pain, for example, like what's your, what's your advice? I definitely, I mean, I, based on my at least experience, um, what I felt felt worked was, um, sitting with myself, not going out with friends and being busy or like watching Netflix or like whatever, like sit with yourself and listen to yourself. Like, what are you feeling? You know, like ask yourself, how are you? How am I? Um, and if you feel emotional and you feel like you need to cry because you're not doing well, then please cry. That release is so important. I feel like we don't cry enough as a society. Um, and and that's, your, that's, a, that's a physical release, right? So crying is actually really important. So if you feel like these pent up emotions when you sit by yourself, let it go. Just let it, just let it go. Just cry. Cry yourself to sleep. Cry, cry, cry as much as you need to cry. Get it out, basically. Um, so acceptance is, and, and that is part of the acceptance, I guess, stage in a way, right? You're accepting how you're feeling, you're, effect, you're accepting how it's affecting you, etc. And then once you, you know, feel comfortable accepting it and recognizing what's happening to you, then think about how you're going to learn from this experience, right? So what are the, and this comes, it's easier to come for you, for this to come kind of after the fact almost, but I think I was very mindful in 2018 about my daily learnings almost, right? Okay, so what did I learn today from going to my treatment? How, what did I learn today from going to my sound healing? What did I, you know, learn today from this difficult conversation I had with my partner at the time? Um, so taking these kind of daily learnings and you end up growing, like you really end up growing. It's, it's really an acceleration of growth in a way. And that's why I say, like, I think regardless of what you believe in, God, the universe, energy, etc., it's happening for a reason. It really is happening for a reason, but it's up to you to understand why it's happening and what you can learn from it and how you're going to grow from it. Because you don't want to go back to square one after go having gone through something like this, you know? 
That's very true. You you want yeah. you, it, but it starts with you, as you said. You need to have that willingness uh, to improve or willingness to to learn something from it. Absolutely. Yeah. My last question to you, and I hear Ciso in the background. I know. I'm sorry, my little one. My last question to you: If if I were to give you a magic wand, what's the one thing you would change in the world? Wow. Um, I think I would reignite empathy across all humans. I know it's in all of us. But many have forgotten that that empathy and that altruism that we were talking about that's inside of us. We are all born as good people, but some of us just end up straying the wrong way. And I think if I had a magic wand, like the fairy godmother in Cinderella, where I'm like, empathy, 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 empathy that's what I would do. I love that. Thank you so much, Sonia, for your You're time. Welcome. Thank had you. A, a, lots of learning. Thanks a lot for sharing so openly. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you to the listeners and the viewers. Yeah. And everyone who's listening, um, this is episode seven of Conversations with Lulu. And uh, I'd love your support. If you like the show, please subscribe. Uh, it's Conversation with Lulu on all the podcast players. Uh, and there's also Conversations with Lulu YouTube channel. And uh, please share and tell your friends about it if you like it. And stay safe, everybody. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can support the show by subscribing for free and leaving us a review on any of the platforms. Until next time, stay safe, everyone.